I'm calling this message, ironically enough, uncontainable. Here's a Chris Tomlin song, Indescribable. You know that song. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you call them or you know them by name. You are amazing, God, all-powerful, untamable, all struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing, God. O oh, holy night has not come yet, but we are searching our hearts for the ways God has been faithful. And we trace the things that God has done in this world and in our lives, and we thank him for it. Get this, God who is indescribable, so much so that we can't even name him. He has so many names because one is not enough. One little girl asked her mom, Mom, why do we have so many languages in the world? My teacher taught me there were over 6,000 spoken languages. And mom said, I don't know, honey. I guess one is not enough to worship our king. When the indescribable God intersects with humble, grateful hearts who, who present ourselves and say, okay, God, whatever you want, you could count on me. Here am I, send me then our joy is uncontainable, and our praise just flows. We worship the King. So I'm going to invite you to, to join me in reading together Luke 1, verse 39. This is the part where Mary sings out because she visits her cousin Elizabeth. Luke chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, please take one. We have them in the seats in front of you. And if you don't own one, you, you do now. Take that with you and get to know it. These are the words of life. In Luke 1.39, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she, she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in Elizabeth's womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cries out exuberantly. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you, Mary. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be fulfilled, would be accomplished, would come to pass. And with that, Mary goes into this soliloquy. She just spontaneously bursts into praise. Here is Mary who knows God's word. And we see in her song a lot of echoes from another mother who was barren, who, who had a baby. Her name was Hannah, and she had a baby named Samuel. Samuel would grow up to anoint Israel's greatest king, David. And when Hannah found out that she was with child, she went into this song, and we, we see a lot of it here because Mary was drawing on the word of God. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. In Latin, the first word out of her lips is magnificat. And this is Mary's magnificat. It's been sung by choruses, it has been whispered in monasteries for centuries. It has been played out in, in, in pageants. Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord. How can it not? My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. He's been mindful of the humble state of his servant. For now on, all generations will call me blessed. And do we not? For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Mary says, the God with which we have to do is the God who turns this world upside down. The people who thrust themselves to the front the, the people who put themselves on top and put their foot on the necks of others are the ones who are going to be toppled and the humble will be lifted up. We're living in that day of reckoning right now, aren't we? 
in Hollywood, in Washington, D.C., and across our land. There are those who thought they could get away with stuff by using their power to advance the careers of others if these others would provide favors for them. And Mary says, oh, no, you don't. God will say, enough is enough. I love the picture, before we finish reading it, the picture of the parade that's come into town. And the most important people are up at the front. And the ones who are the politicians and the celebrities and, and the baseball players, as we saw over here, all of the ones that we, we honor and we worship is the, the ones to emulate. And then the riffraff come at the end. You know, the ones that, that clean up the poop from the horses. You know, the ones that, that, you don't remember their names. They're nobody. And then Jesus enters the parade, and he goes to the back of the line, and he says, stop, we're going this way. And he turns the whole procession around, and the first are last, and the last are first. Mary says, God is amazing. His mercy extends to those who fear him. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. But he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. She reaches back and she says, every promise God ever made, he fulfills. He's a God of promises. He speaks a word and he calls us to be a people of faith, a people of trust. And so Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then she returned home. This passage is about joy. This passage is about uncontainable joy. Now that Mary knows that she is to be a mother and that her cousin Elizabeth was pregnant herself, a woman who was too old to have children. In fact, she was barren and everybody knew it. And now she's going to have a child. Mary could not contain her excitement. She had to rush to go to her cousin. A journey of three to five days at best. Probably attached herself to a caravan that was traveling because it was way too dangerous for a young lady to be moving on those roads by herself. And so she goes to, in order to rejoice together. I remember when my wife, Laura, became pregnant. We wanted to share everyone with everyone our joy, but I wanted to jump the gun. And I remember coming to church and coming to a service and letting everybody know that, that we're expecting a child. And then the next service was the one my wife came to, and I went to her and I said, hey, is it okay if I share with the church that we're uh, gonna have a baby? I'm not sure what the words were she said, but I read it loud and clear in her eyes. And she's like, she said all of this. We haven't told anybody yet. You know, we, you can't jump the gun here. And so I said, uh, uh, the cat's out of the bag. I already told the last service. You know, I should have just asked for forgiveness, not permission at all. But I, could, I was uncontainable. I got up and I shared with everybody. And let me tell you, that wasn't even our first child. That was our sixth child. That happened here in this church. And we were standing right over there, and I'd already told the 8 o'clock service, and she's still working on forgiving me for that. <laughs> Joy, th listen, Mary, this is her first child. Elizabeth, this is her first child. The joy, I know the child's not even here yet. We're not supposed to sing the carols yet. <laughs> we can't contain it. We are going to sing because God is faithful yet again. Joy is the major theme of this story. You see three people rejoicing for everything God has done in this story. There's the joy of Elizabeth. As Mary entered her home, she was most likely surprised to see her. Three to five days to get there and, oh, what are you doing here, you know? But it was Mary's greeting that set off her joy. It was more than, hey, good morning. Anybody home? Surprise. Greetings were normally blessings meant to bestow peace. And as Mary entered the house, Elizabeth heard her greeting, and she was immediately filled with God's Holy Spirit. She sang out in spontaneous praise, and the one word that came to her lips was blessed. Blessed, not am I, blessed are you. And she said, blessed is the one who believed. I, I wonder if this is against the backdrop of her husband, who's not even speaking. The angel said, because of your unbelief, you will not even be able to sing your praises to God. Not until a child comes, and then your lips will be loosed. But for now, because you heard God's word and you did not believe, you're paying the consequences in the meantime. Elizabeth says to Mary, blessed is the one who believed God's word. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said. I said earlier, God is a God of promises. He calls us to be a people of faith, a people of trust. God is a God of promises. He gives us many, many promises. And believe me, your faith will be tested. Everything around you in this world is screaming against God. 
and is screaming against you to say he is not worthy of his word. That's a Mickey Mouse, mamby-pamby faith that you're hanging on to you. We're a people of science. We're a people of the world. We're a people of intellect. We're a people of experience. God does not answer the way that you're expecting him to answer. Talk to Elizabeth. <laughs> God spoke to her in a different way. Everything will scream against you and have you questioning God. The serpent will come to you in the garden and say, is it true that God says that you are not allowed to eat from any of this stuff here? He'll come to you if you're Sarah. You're past the age of childbearing and still no son. Promises become precious when everything points out their impossibility. I hope to God you were here last week when Josh Wicker brought the word of God to us. And if not, get online and see when he brings the message of the impossibilities because Josh Wicker said, when it's impossible to you, it's just right for God. Whatever is impossible to you, that's just right for God. For nothing shall be impossible for God. You are blessed, Elizabeth says, when you take God's word and you trust him. Even though it's crazy talk. No man is involved and you're pregnant. Who's going to believe that? You believe that. And you are blessed because of it. Elizabeth was overjoyed when Mary, the mother of her Lord, came to her. The second person we read about is the joy of the unborn son, John. When Mary's greeting reached Elizabeth's ears, the baby leaped in her womb. Have you ever seen a pregnant mother's belly move? All right? Yes, you have. Some of you are the pregnant mothers in here. You've been there. And, hey, the baby just moved. Man, let me encourage you to resist the urge to touch a stranger's belly. A pregnant belly is like a magnet. Oh, can I touch that? Who do you think you are? Keep your hands off. Actually, it's beautiful, isn't it? There's life there. But hey, come here. The baby just moved. Feel this. I don't know what it feels like. Men, we don't have any clue what it feels like. The women, they do. And Elizabeth said, Mary, when you greeted me, the baby, I felt this baby move. This baby's doing cartwheels right now. This baby is jumping. And I wonder if that is the fulfillment of the angel's promise to Zechariah back in the temple when he talked to him about his son and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Even before he is born, John is attesting to the greater one, Jesus, who's in his company, in his mother's womb. They're both pregnant. And John is saying he is the one who must increase. I am the one who must decrease. And he is leaping for joy at the voice of the bridegroom. Elizabeth was overjoyed. John, yet unborn, is overjoyed. And then Mary is the one who is joyful. It dawns on her she will be the mother of the Messiah. I wonder if she put all that together. An angel comes to her, you're going to have a child. That's amazing. He puts that together with prophecies from of old. This is the dream of Israel, of all of our people. It would be like you and I waiting for the second coming of Christ. And an angel appears to you to tip you off when it's going to happen and you're going to be the first one and you're going to introduce him, something like that. This is the dream of her people. And she's putting all of this together and she has to explain to Joseph in a dream. An angel comes to Joseph in the dream to say, it's good, it's good. But now she's with Elizabeth. And Elizabeth says, how is it that the mother of my Lord, whoa, succeeding generations would call Mary the mother of God. Get your mind around that. That you can raise the Son of God. It's all just coming in. And so when all this comes crashing in together for her realization, Mary breaks out into song. We call it the Magnificat. It's at the intersection of the indescribable God who was fulfilling his ancient promises and the young woman who felt so blessed to be chosen by God to play a part in his story. Her joy and her praise become uncontainable. Joy is yours. Do you know that? Do you believe that? When people introduce you to others, would they say, she has joy? He has joy. This is a joyous person. Would you say you have joy? Or has the joy been squeezed out because of the stress of life, because of worry? The answer is to worship the king. That's the remedy. To, because worship restores our joy. It places our eyes off of ourselves and our, worse, our, our worries, our responsibilities, our cares and our anxieties. and places them on the one who is 
holy, the one who is magnificent. Is your joy absent because of grief or loneliness? The answer is to worship the king. I remember the day that Carol Jordan came to the altar down here. She'd lost her second of three children. She'd already lost one, and Kimberly was taken from her. And in her grief, she's at the altar pouring out her heart to the Lord. And some time had passed, but, but grief, it lingers, doesn't it? You're, it's okay, you lose a mom and a dad, but you lose a spouse, you lose a child. There's something unnatural about that. And so Carol's here at the altar, and I remember the Lord spoke to me and gave me a word. I'd never heard anything like this before. But I went up to her, and I remember saying to Carol something like this. Carol, I know you miss Kimberly deeply. And, if, and there's coming a day, we're promised there's coming a day when you'll be reunited. But if you would like to be in her company right now, worship the king. Because Kimberly is worshiping him in his presence. And when we here on earth bow, fall to our knees, and we worship the king, heaven and earth come together. Somehow we're all in the presence of the king. If you're grieving, if you're lonely, worship the king. It will restore joy. Maybe you have little joy because it's been displaced by your selfishness. You're just self-preoccupied. You can't see past the end of your own nose, and you're struggling with this. The remedy is to worship the king, and worship begins with gratitude. It starts with taking account of everything going on in your life and saying, you know what, God has done this, he has done this, he has done this, and I'm going to take time to recount it. The Bible calls that meditation, to meditate on the acts of God, to meditate on the works of God, all of the things that he has done. It requires opening our eyes to what God is doing and sometimes seeing the things that he has done in a fresh new light. Some of you have seen this. There's a video going around on Facebook, uh, social media the last couple weeks, but we just had to capture this. Take a look at this video. <laughs> I'm alive! I'm alive! I love the coffee. <laughs> I thank God for coffee. And for the hot water on our showers, you know, the running water, the toilets, you know, all the things that we are given, even shoes. You know, this kind of gratitude, opening our eyes to see that God has gifted us. He's blessed us every single day. He's taken care of us. This is contagious. And other people are drawn to the God who, who provides for us, who is a God of his word. I remember uh, children, children have a way of doing this. I remember when my daughter Annie, she's our second daughter, when she was about two years old. Is Annie here today? She's not here. She's sleeping in. She's back from college. <laughs> Annie was two years old, and she had wake, awoken with a dream, okay? And she wanted to tell everybody her dream. And in her excitement as a two-year-old who's just mastering the language, she was just going through it with mommy. And she says, and mommy, you were there in the dream. And da, da, da. And Sarah Beth, she was there in the dream. And then, and, 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 uh, uh, who's that man who lives with us? <laughs> Laura says, your daddy? Yeah, yeah, daddy was in the dream too. <laughs> what? Who is that man who lives with us? I don't remember the dream, but I remember that part. 
Am I not around here enough? Do I need to work from home? <laughs> but when you're excited, it just spills over, doesn't it? It just, it just comes out, you know, in all of its beauty and all of its mess. And we're able to, to share that love with one another. This week I was blessed in meeting a guy by the name of Mahdi Fati. Mahdi is Persian. He's from Iran. And uh, he, he just, he was on his quest back home and he asked God, I don't understand. One God? So many people in the world. How, how can all the people in the world with so many different languages worship one God? If you are true, would you show yourself to me? And then he told me this story this week of, of how God has been chasing him. And God has been opening his eyes to see him in the little things. And now this guy is here in America. He has got a bachelor's degree, two masters, I believe, maybe three, and a Ph.D. He has, ser- he has worked in France, in Paris, France. He's worked in Belgium. He went to uh, Singapore to, to go to grad school. And now here in the States, and four weeks ago, he ba- got baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ. And he came in. I thought he was going to tell me about that whole story of how he came to. He just told me about the ways God has shown up this week. And he said, I didn't know that God speaks to you and you can hear him. Okay? i got to tell you a very quick story. My daughter, Gracie, is up at Pittsburgh in college. And she wakes up every morning with two roommates. Her alarm means nothing. Okay? Some of you know what that means. The alarm goes off and it just, you hit it and you don't even know that you hit it. And so she's dependent on Libby, who, who sleeps in a bed across the room here. And Libby always leans over and says, Gracie. I guess she whispers not to wake up Evie, the other girl. She, Gracie. And that wakes her up every time. Well, on Wednesday this past week, Gracie was the last student in the room. The other two had already gone home for Christmas. And so Gracie didn't know how she was going to wake up to take her exam at 8 o'clock in the morning. So she called Libby or texted her. She said, could you record yourself whispering my name? She did. She sent it to Gracie. Gracie put it in as her alarm. Another girl on the hall for backup came in. I'll, I'll wake you up. She came into the room about the very same time. Gracie's out, and they both hear, Gracie. And Gracie woke up. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I know I didn't get that story exactly right, Laura, and you'll explain it to me for the 11 o'clock service. But that's the way I remember it. My, <laughs> I love this woman. Mahdi Fati, this guy from Persia, raised a Muslim, and he asked about Jesus, asked about God, and God revealed himself in Jesus. He said, this week, God speaks to me in the middle of the night. He says, hello, and I wake up, there is nobody around, and he says, I find myself praising him. It's just overflowing, and this is the way it works. Um, there is a holiday you and I may not be aware of. It's called Watch Night. Does anybody know what Watch Night is? It's established in the African-American communities that on December 31st, starting back in 1862, Watch Night was established as a gathering to celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation becoming law. When the clock struck midnight on January 1st, 1863, all slaves in the Confederate states were proclaimed free. Since that date, African Americans have celebrated the good news of freedom in local churches on New Year's Eve. And if they've ever invited you to one of these, you know, go. It it, it sounds like it's very inspiring. I've never been to one. But this is the way it was described way back in the day by Booker T. Washington writing about the very first watch night. He says, as the great day grew nearer, there was more singing in the slave quarters than usual. It was bolder, had more ring. And lasted later into the night. True, they had sung these same verses before. But they had been careful to explain that the freedom we're singing about in these songs refers to the next world. And had no connection with life in this world. So so we're safe. We're not going anywhere. Now, they gradually threw off the mask. And were not afraid to let it be known that the freedom in their songs meant freedom of the body in this world. I can only imagine what that first watch night was like to know that we are a free people. But the anticipation going into it just spills over, and we can't but sing. You see, we worship from our overflow. We worship when we are filled with gratitude and awe for God coming near, God breaking not only into the world as we read about the stories in the Bible. That happened so long ago, Pastor. But as we experience the joy of God breaking into our own lives. 
Mary thanked God for all he does for any who are humble because he did it for her. Because she knows what it's like to be lowly. And when we realize that God loves me, even me, then something changes. Let me say this before we finish up. John Wesley, the guy who started this whole Methodist revival 200 years ago or more. John Wesley was an Anglican priest, Church of England, and uh, he, he would say that he preached the gospel and he administered the sacraments. He even became a missionary and came to Georgia here in America for a couple of years and then went back, and he still didn't know the assurance of salvation until one particular day when John, he experienced his assurance of salvation on May 24th, 1738. He reluctantly attended a group meeting that evening on a street called Aldersgate in London. He heard somebody reading from Luther's preface to the epistle of Romans. And he says it this way. He wrote in his journal that night about 8.45 p.m. While, he, while that guy was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I, John, felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and of death. That moment marks, in John Wesley's account, his conversion to Christianity. He was a priest, but he didn't know Jesus. And he said, what I have been preaching for the masses is that these promises are for all people. I own for myself, and I, I owned it for for what it was, that God has saved me from my sins. There's something deeply personal that happens when you meet that God. And he's got your name. Can you remember that day? Can you remember your B.C. years, your B.C. days before Christ broke into your life? And can you remember that watch night when you were free? What was it like? And, and how are you sharing that with others? Before you go to bed tonight... I want to challenge everybody in this room to get out a piece of paper and a pencil. Something happens when pencil hits paper and you record something that's happening inside of you. I want you to write down five things that God has done for you personally. Not, yeah, God loves people. No, that, don't put that on your list. Does God love you? Write that down. And if you can recount the moment, can you can recount the, the time that he showed up and he showed himself to you, write that down. That's your story. And you and I have a Magnificat to draw on that when God shows up yet again and he speaks your name, Gracie, get out of bed. Madi, hello. When God shows up, you have something to rejoice about. But write that down and then share that with somebody. Share that. Share the good news. You see, worship happens. We worship the king when we focus. It's a matter of focusing. It's taking our eyes off of ourselves, off of our situation and our problems, off of the lies that come against us and say, God is not going to answer his promises. You take your eyes off of all of those and you place your eyes on God. And you say, God, I will sing your praises. You are indescribable and uncontainable and so is my joy. So is my love. We're going to finish our service together. I'm going to ask the team to come up and lead us in, in that Chris Tomlin song, uh, Indescribable. And whatever it is you're going to put on your list tonight, if you haven't already put that down, give God the glory. Give God the praise for how he is breaking into your world. Father, we turn our eyes to you. Hear us as we sing your praises. Hear us as our hearts are uncontainable for all the things that you are doing in our lives. We give you all the glory and the praise in Jesus' name.